Okay, now we're going to talk about uh, provider systems here in Module 3. Uh, we know that the four P's are the provider, payer, patient, and public. So the provider systems will be the first area that we will go into because it's one of the largest and one of the most widely used. So what are we focusing here on? We're focusing on the, the systems that providers use for medical services and for integration with other stakeholders. So this will include the doctors, hospitals, laboratories, uh, pharmacies, ancillary providers like DMEs, and anyone else who might be connected to these uh, stakeholders. So typically, a provider office system will assist patients and staff um, by setting up appointments, verifying and generating referrals. It'll conduct billing, reporting, and claims generation. We're talking primarily a lot of back-end stuff here for providers. Now, there are other systems uh, that will do other things like e-prescribing. There are more clinical systems that will collect medical data such as an MRI or an EKG and store that information. All of this would go into provider systems. But one of the things that we're going to be focusing on are not really the clinical systems per se, with the exception of EHR. We're going to talk about managing workflow and managing uh, the longitudinal patient record uh, for uh, providers. So what does a provider system really have to have? Well, it's going to have to have practice management, which is functionality that handles day-to-day -day practice activities like scheduling, billing, claim submissions, and workflow. Uh, we really wanted to have the electronic health record, which is the longitudinal legal medical record uh, for patients' treatment diagnosis, and it gives us that history. That's where the doctor can basically go back in, look at what is going on, and help make uh, future treat diagnoses or uh, ensure that treatments are applicable. And we'll talk about things that are important here, such as uh, things like uh, maintaining allergies, maintaining prescriptions, uh, and understanding those uh, historical conditions that would potentially have an adverse effect on quality of care. We'll also talk about revenue cycle management, which is functionality that manages patient encounter, uh, which is information for the purposes of expediting reimbursement. Now, this may be done at the provider, or it may be done by a third-party billing company that will actually take the diagnosis and treatments uh, and run with that uh, at its own, uh, you know, using its own system uh, to the payers. They understand how the individual payers will actually uh, pay certain treatments and diagnosis. So they're able to slightly modify the codes, not change a treatment and diagnosis, but use a different code so that they can maximize the reimbursement. Uh, you'll also uh, find document management systems, which we won't really be talking about, but these are systems that manage documents, both scanned uh, and electronic documents, so that they can be easily retrieved. Systems like SharePoint, Microsoft SharePoint, can be used for document management, as well as an open source system called Alfresco. And well, one of the other emerging areas is e-prescribing, where doctors will actually create an electronic prescription that will automatically get sent to the pharmacy, uh, the e-prescribing also looks for adverse events uh, and counter uh, counter indications of um, the care that the prescription will actually perform. So what types of technology can be put in place for a provider system? Well, technically it could be standalone, which is unconnected externally. So in other words, it's just one system that sits uh, sits there but has no connection to any other system. Another one is standalone that is connected externally to a hospital system or to other providers, maybe within the same practice. Uh, we may have just practice wide, where if there are multiple places, uh, like a uh, an orthopedic group that has five or six facilities, they may be connected internally within the practice, or practice wide again, all of them are connected together, or it's a single system, and then it can connect to say a hospital system as well. And another one is application services based, and this is more of like cloud computing, whereby the electronic health record would actually be stored in the cloud. Generally, client server based systems uh, are, are used. However, some other systems that are ASP based provide a little bit more um, ubiquity in terms of the technology they use. The difference between a client server and an ASP based system is that with a client server based system, the software will have to be upgraded on the system and maintained at the provider or at the practice. Whereas an ASP, which is in the cloud, the provider has no knowledge of how that is actually done and they're just utilizing the software for their particular functions. All of that is managed by a third party. Uh, another thing that the provider systems do is they actually manage financial cycles. 
So they will basically look at the patient information uh, for expediency and accuracy. They will ensure that the charges are reflected accurately and timely. They will ensure that uh, payments are done at time of service. Uh, they will make sure that the coding is done properly, things that uh, are so that things are not coded incorrectly. You know, an example of something that would be coded incorrectly would be where if someone broke a right arm, and then when you go to the treatment, you've indicated a code for a left arm cast. So that would be an example of a coding error. Uh, these types of systems try and ensure that that does not happen. And then the processing of claims, such that when a claim gets actually sent, it's managed to ensure that the insurance company is sending a timely payment back. Another thing prior to claims processing might be to ensure that the, there is uh, allowable benefits for a particular procedure. So for example, if an MRI requires authorization, the system might automatically send a, an electronic document uh, for electronic authorization. And then if the uh, patient's benefits package has that available and based on a particular diagnosis, the a response will come back from the system, from a rules-based system, that will say yes it is authorized based on uh, the information that was provided. So let's briefly talk about electronic medical records, then we'll talk about electronic health records. Uh, we had mentioned that back in the 80s uh, we had the notion of a computerized patient record which was this historical information of a patient that attended a doctor. But there was no real standard and there was no way to integrate that information across multiple sites. We get this notion of the electronic medical record, which is very similar. However, what this is is a computerized legal medical record that is created in an organization that delivers care uh, for the from the hospital or from a particular provider. The EMRs are usually standalone. Uh, they're part of a standalone health information system. So there's really no interconnectivity for EMRs. And that would ultimately be the, the primary difference between the EMR and the EHR. And what I've done is I've included a couple of things from IOM, from HIMSS, and AHIMA. And you should become familiar with HIMSS, which is the Health Information Management System Society. You can take a look at their website, which is himss.org, and AHIMA, the American Health Information Management Association, or AHIMA.org. And you can read how they had migrated uh, from the EMR to the EHR uh, terminology. Ultimately, they, right now they are the same thing because while EMR really refers to standalone, that was an archaic uh, term prior to the internet proliferation and the ability and ease of network and internet connectivity of computers. Once we had that, it became obvious that EMRs would be interconnected. And so we have this EHR term, which is basically, again, a longitudinal legal record that is a systematic collection of all of the information that can be shared amongst different healthcare settings. It's network connected, it is enterprise wide, and includes a lot more data. Now, we're going to prefer the EHR term for one simple reason. In the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or the Stimulus Bill, where part of it was the High Tech Act, where the uh, incentives are being provided to providers for uh, implementation of a system. They classified the system as an electronic healthcare record, especially as part of what is called the meaningful use criteria. The meaningful use criteria is specifically designed to certify when an incentive payment can be made from the federal government to the provider for the implementation of a valid EHR. So we are going to prefer the EHR as the term to use. So the Commission for Certification of Healthcare Information Technology is a nonprofit organization that served to certify EHR records. And this is one of the criteria by which the incentive payments are uh, given. Uh, the reason this organization was founded in 2004 was because a number of healthcare software companies were creating EHRs and there was no standards put in place at all. What this tried to do was ensure the compatibility of the HIT products so that if a doctor had a particular record, it could send it to another doctor and it would be incorporated into their, uh, into their uh, system. Um, it also assured payers and purchasers uh, that were providing incentives for EHRs that there would be an ROI and that we should have improved quality. Uh, that was one of the goals. There are still some papers out there that are not so clear on whether that is true or not. Um, but also that it provided guidelines by which you could protect the privacy of patients' personal health information and that it would meet the standards set forth by HIPAA. 
There were a number of certifications from 2006 to 2011. They were classified by year. Those have since been removed, and now there is just a standard certification for all of them uh, based on the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Now, clinical electronic data, uh, we should have this data that can move back and forth between systems. And what we did is, um, there's a little error on here, it says HER system, but it is an EHR system that is a PowerPoint error. Uh, it keeps doing the autocorrect. But in order to do this, we need to be able to send this data back and forth. Well, how we do that is uh, there are two formats, which are both acceptable. The continuity of care document and the continu uh, continuity of care record. Uh, these are basically formats that are set forth as part of a clinical document architecture or uh, an ANSI standard. Uh, both are acceptable for, uh, for incentive payments. Um, what you're going to see is that the CCD is really a subset of what's called an HL7 clinical document architecture. And what that is, HL7 is a standard by which it says how information across the disciplines of, say, oncology and uh, pharmaceut uh, pharmacy or prescription drugs or cardiology or gastroenterology, uh, what should be contained within that document in order for another doctor to make accurate diagnosis or provide a consultation. Uh, these documents are actually communicated not in what is EDI, but in uh, XML-type documents. And we'll talk a little bit about XML at a later, in, in a later class, not in this class. Uh, I'll briefly go over EDI, but we won't, do, we won't be doing XML in this case. Now, e-prescribing is getting more utilization by providers. Uh, it basically is the ability to send an accurate, error-free understandable prescription directly to a pharmacy from the point of care. That is the definition from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, we all know the joke that you can't read a prescription uh, because the doctor writes it and, and usually pharmacies or uh, pharmacists need to take a special course in poor handwriting so that they can read it. Uh, this is supposed to uh, prevent any errors that occur because the pharmacist cannot read the prescription clearly. Um, it was estimated in 2005 that there were over a half a million adverse drug events among Medicare beneficiaries alone because of negatively interacting drugs with the patient or there was insufficient information about the patient's medical history, along with just errors that occurred in the prescription, say 10 milligrams as opposed to 1.0 milligrams because the period was missing. Um, as of June 2012, about half of the physicians in the U.S. are using some form of e-prescribing, so that is a big positive. When you walk into the doctor, if there's a prescription, they will automatically send the prescription over to the pharmacy, and it should be there waiting for you when you are done. Again, if you think about this, that's more of a retail-like atmosphere. So what are some of the challenges? Well, providers face the same challenges as other businesses. It is a cost to implement these uh, software applications. Uh, there is question of productivity and efficiency gains, so it may inhibit faster patient care depending on the complexity. There have been some reports in Canada that the implementation of the EHR system has caused a 50% reduction in, uh, in ability of providers to see patients. Now, that is, we don't know anything about exactly how it was implemented. We don't, I don't know how the study was done. Um, however, that would basically mean that a doctor whereby they were seeing two patients can now only see one patient. Now this could be a workflow problem, workflow problem. it could be a, uh, an ergonomic issue with the uh, technology that's being used. Uh, there are many different things, but there seems to be a consistent pattern that use of the technology does cause some loss in productivity, and that could be because of the nature of the healthcare domain as opposed to other domains like banking and retail. Uh, one of the key complaints is that providers may focus shift away from the patient towards the technology. So, for example, they may be talking to you, and instead of writing on the uh, on a pad or on a note uh, file notes, they actually turn your their backs and they go onto a computer terminal. And this could easily be solved later on by changing layouts of uh, the doctor's offices. Standardization. Recent legislation may mandates standardization, but the process is not fully complete. We'd like to think there are, and there are some. Uh, initiatives underway, but this is not fully complete, and if history serves correctly, um, it will never be complete. It is a constantly changing and moving target. You just hope that you get better and better as, uh, as, as time goes on. These systems are also very complex for small provider offices that may need additional support. They may need additional uh, IT personnel, uh, and it increases the cost, and 
Thus, it can eliminate the incentives that are being provided by the federal government or hospitals. Uh, but this will also lead to increased consolidation where doctors will band together or they will be part of a larger system so that they don't have to deal with that. And then it becomes a regular organization with its own IT department, etc. There's also cultural change. EHR changes the way providers work. Uh, older providers will have significant adoption issues, and we'll see that in a slide later, and newer providers may not. But the costs may present a barrier for newer providers because they have significant uh, costs to become a, a doctor, again, leading to significant integration within the industry. So in 2006, the average cost uh, was about $32,000 uh, per physician. This number has since jumped up. Uh, now you have it still around uh, where it would be about fifty or 60000 per physician uh, in 2009. The chart below comes from a Pricewaterhouse uh, Cooper's uh, report. Uh, and you can see that it basically the HR system can basically cost between thirty-three and sixty thousand dollars for three physician, you know, for three physicians. Again, that's a per physician cost. Uh, the reason for that is the amount of data, the amount of uh, information that needs to be put in from a legacy perspective. So the question is, do the incentive payments really provide enough of an incentive to do this? The answer is a lot of providers are jumping on it because it is a, a significant amount of money that's provided by the federal government. So right now, the adoption rates are still low. Uh, however, the uh, Health and Human Services did uh, meet its target of 50% adoption by physicians and 80% adoption by hospitals. Uh, you'd like to see it a little bit higher uh, than it is, but right now that's, uh, that's where we stand. So there's about a 54% adoption rate of EMRs by physicians and, and clinics. 64% of physicians under 50 have adopted the EHR systems. Uh, less than 50% of physicians over 50 adopted an EHR system. We do know that the practice size is a critical factor. 29% of solo practitioners have actually implemented EHR, while 62% of physicians with 3 to 10 doctor practices have implemented an EHR system. Again, demonstrating that the consolidation and integration of physicians into these larger groupings uh, actually is... Uh, going to be beneficial for the implementation of an EHR because they can have an economies of scale. It is very, very difficult for a solo practitioner to implement an effective EHR. In terms of hospitals, less than 10% had a, a comprehensive EHR in 2010. That number in three years jumped to 80%. Uh, now, they did have some sort of systems, but they weren't necessarily complete. But now, because of certain criteria, we're saying that a fully functional uh, EHR system for a hospital is regulated by the meaningful use criteria, and that number has jumped to 80%. So I wouldn't put too much faith in the 10% because we need to match uh, what the meaningful use criteria is now to what hospitals had back in 2010. But that is the statistic that you would see. So the historical reasons for low adoption, lack of capital, finding a system that meet, met their needs, uncertain ROI, uh, and the fear that EHR would be obsolete. That last one is no longer uh, applicable. This was back in 2010 prior to the, uh, actually 2009, prior to the implementation of the ARR Act. Uh, with in inpatient hospital, inadequate capital, maintenance costs, and then physician resistance within the hospital, um, I will actually make a paper available on Blackboard for you so that you can actually read about some of the contentiousness between physicians, nurses, and administrators about the implementation of EHR systems. So some of the uh, systems that are uh, out there for providers all scripts, eClinical Works, Epic, NextGen, Practice Fusion. Um, and for inpatient or hospitals, you will also see Epic, Eclipsis, Cerner, Meditech, CPSI, and Siemens. So you can Google these or take a look online and see what you can find about them uh, to know what they, uh, where they're implemented um, and uh, what some of their features are.